Hey, I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is our text, and uh, if you are in the room, whether here at Sweetwater or at our Parker campus, and you don't have a Bible, if you're in Parker, grab one off the table in the back, or it's right there, and turn to page 1032, and you can find our text. If you're at Sweetwater, then just reach under the chairs around you, grab one of the Bibles, and turn to page 1032, and you'll be able to follow along in the text as well. And as always, uh, no matter what campus you are, uh, or even if you're joining us online, then if you don't have a Bible, we want you to take one of those with you if you're in one of our rooms. Uh, it's our gift to you. Or if you're online, let us know. If you need a Bible, we'll get one to you. We'll mail it to you, to hand deliver it, whatever we need to do. Because we want everyone to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, uh, just a shout out to the Parker campus because they've got Vacation Bible School coming up. They've had some youth activities coming up. Great things are going on. They're working on their new campus uh, remodel. So uh, God is good, and I'm excited. So I hope you guys are excited as well. Hey, uh, yeah, give it up. Parkers are clapping for you. They're cheering for you because uh, we're excited too. And uh, now I got I to gotta address one quick little thing. If you are a detail person, you're going to notice this. Maybe you already noticed this. Uh, if you're like me and you don't pay attention to details, uh, a, a lot of times you, you just, you're going to have to look and go, oh, I didn't see that. Uh, if you're looking at your life notes, it's got the wrong date on it. It's got next weekend's date on it. Uh, and uh, there's a reason for that next weekend. We're going to have this weekend's date on it, uh, just in case you're curious. Uh, not because we wanted to test and see if you would find it or not, but, uh, you know, sickness happens, and Pastor Joe is scheduled to preach this weekend. He got COVID last weekend, and, uh, you know, he's fine now, but midweek, uh, we had to make a call, and we just said, hey, we can swap weekends. That's one of the great things about having a team. So, uh, so if, that's, if that's upsetting to you because of your OCD, just understand there's a reason why we just decided not to, you know, reprint a thousand bulletins, uh, life notes. So uh, we just went with the ones we had because we love our earth. Hey, happy Independence Day weekend. I know, I know. Hey, can I just confess, I love our country. I mean, we have a nation of freedom, of prosperity, of opportunity. I mean, it's a nation that was founded with biblical principles at its core. And, uh, and I'm biased, but uh, I believe the United States of America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Anybody else? Yeah. Of course, I also know our country is a mess right now. Right? I mean, we're, we're divided, we're angry, we're accusative, everything is politicized. And, and I mean, we have crisis all over the place. We have crisis with inflation, with schools, with employment, with crime, with housing, with health care, and I could just keep going on. And, and here's the thing. I would absolutely love to fix our, na our nation. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Good, because that's what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about how we can impact our nation, our communities, our neighbors according to the will of God. Now, we know one day God's going to make a new heaven, new earth. I mean, it's going to be perfect. Uh, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, no more dying. But here's the thing. Until that day, I believe God is calling his followers to make our nation, our world, our communities a better place. Okay, that, 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 I, that's just my conviction. Uh, so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal, and you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you should probably want to pay attention to how Jesus says you can change our world, our nation, our communities. Uh, now, if you're not yet a, a Christian, then if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then uh, listen in because you might be surprised at, at what Jesus says. Because I, I just want you to hear this. There's over 2 billion professing Christians in our world. There are over 200 million in the United States alone. And, and if all of us just followed Jesus' directions, can you imagine the impact we could have on this world? Yes. Could you imagine the impact we could have on this country? 
are just our cities. So uh, here's the thing, though. We're not accountable for other people. We're only accountable for ourselves. You're accountable for you and what you do and how you live for Jesus. So I can only choose how I'm going to live, so I have to decide if I'm going to listen to Jesus, follow Jesus, and change the world. Uh, and that's really what I'm going to try to convince you to do uh, today. I'm going to try to convince you to listen to Jesus and, and follow Jesus and obey Jesus and see how Jesus is going to change your life, your family, your community, and maybe our nation. So Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. Luke tells us, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, Well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Well, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. Now, this is a familiar story. How many of you have heard the story of the Good Samaritan before? Okay, if you're watching from home, you need to raise your hand too. Uh, <laughs> see, the Good Samaritan, right? I mean, we, we get it. We're supposed to help people stranded on the side of the road. Can we call this a service now and just go home because it's the holiday weekend? No, we can't. Because that's not the point. This is not for Christians to be a spiritual AAA. Okay, now, I, I, I'm not opposed to you stopping and helping people that need help, okay? That's, that's a good thing, but that's not the point of the story. The point is, love God with your entire life and love your neighbor as yourself, and then you will live. You will have life, abundant life, amazing life. Now, what's interesting is the lawyer knew the answer, but he tried to justify himself. He tried to defend his own life by asking Jesus, well, uh, you know, who is my neighbor? I mean, every Jew knew the great commandment. They all knew. They all had it memorized. Every one of them could answer what's the great commandment, what's the, the key. And, and so that was, that was a given. But what they didn't know and what this lawyer is trying to get you know, away from is, is who's my neighbor? What, who, how do I have to define my neighbor? And, and I think he was trying to kind of, well, Scripture tells us he was trying to justify himself. He didn't want to have to, you know, interpret that on his own. And uh, see, I think, like us, he was looking for a passive answer. What does it take for me to love my neighbor? And, and I think he was thinking along the lines of, well, it means I don't hate people, uh, I'm polite, and basically I can ignore the masses. But that's not how Jesus answered, is it? No. See, Jesus makes it extremely clear that what it, what it means to love your neighbor, and since we want life, I mean, do you guys want life? Yeah. Okay, since we want life, then we need to hear what Jesus has to say, and we need to obey and apply it to our lives. So to love your neighbor, to be a good Samaritan, we have to see people with compassion. See people with compassion. I want you to hear this again. You, I, I know you've heard the story before. I just read it. Picking up in verse 31, Jesus is telling the story. The guy's laying there half dead. And now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. 
So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Okay, look, they all saw the man, but only one acted with compassion. Now, now here's the interesting thing that we don't quite get the whole gist of, we don't get the whole emotional impact of. The priest and the Levite, they're the good guys. They're the good guys to all the audience that's listening. They're the heroes, they're the superstars, because the, the priest, I mean, he's the one who got to go and serve God and be in the temple and go into the holy place. I mean, he was, he was big deal. The Levite, I mean, he was one of those that was part of the chosen ones to take care of the temple and take care of the artifacts of God and to go and serve. These guys are a big deal. They're the heroes. They're the best of the Jews. And they walked by on the other side. They ignored the man. They chose not to get involved. Now, the Samaritan, he's the villain. He's the atheist. He's the guy that nobody wants to be. He's the guy that nobody ever thinks of as a hero because the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. You read the Gospels, you see that. You know, there was a point where some Samaritans didn't want Jesus in their town, and, and James and John said, can we call down fire on them? Can we just burn them up? And it kind of tells you, these are the apostles, right? They just, we just want to burn them, watch them burn. They're Samaritans. They, you know, they're not even human, really. And, and so when Jesus uses the Samaritan as the hero, he got everybody's attention. And the Samaritans saw and had compassion. So let me ask you a question. Do you see people? You're like, yeah, we see people. Sometimes we see people we don't want to see people. And there's the problem. How do you see people? When you, when you look and you see people in this world, you know, wherever you are, starting in your family, but also, you know, extending out to the, the people around you, how do you see those people? When you look, what's going on in your brain? Do you see them as your neighbor or do you see them as a nuisance? <laughs> You're like, you don't know my neighbors. They are a nuisance. They turned their house into a VRBO, and now the music plays until 2 a.m., and I can't get any sleep. I keep spreading nails in their dry... No. Uh, see, do you see your, your people as your neighbor or a nuisance? Do you see people as an opportunity or an obstacle? In other words, every person you meet, you know, is that an opportunity to express and demonstrate the love of Christ to them, or are they just in your way? got to get out of my way. I, I've got some place to be. I've got something to do. You're just in my way. You see, if we're going to love like Jesus, which, by the way, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you signed up to do that. But if we're going to love like Jesus, we have to see people like Jesus saw them. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 9 says that Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are lost. They're hopeless. They're desperate. Now, I believe that our problem, talking about those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, isn't that we are heartless. At, at least most of us. I know some of you. So, uh, <laughs> the problem isn't that we're heartless. You know what the problem is? We're busy. We're busy. We're too busy. We're overscheduled with no margin in our lives. We're always yelling at our kids to hurry up, yelling at slow drivers to get out of the way. Oh, that's just me. Uh, <laughs> groaning about having to wait. Okay, does anybody else get annoyed if you go into a restaurant and have a suit and they say it'll be 10 minutes? Come on, go ahead and confess. I mean, I'm like, have a suit? No, I just go to Taco Bell. So, okay. No, the drive through line is way too long for that. So, uh, I mean, we're impatient. We're always in a hurry. We're always running late. You guys know that Jesus never told his followers to be busy? I mean, he told us to be about our Father's business, but he never told us to be busy. See, busyness is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But when you talk to people and you say, how you been? Ah, oh, I'm busy. And sometimes you say busy like it's a badge of honor. I'm so busy. 
Really? Okay. I can't find anywhere in the Word of God where it affirms just being busy, but uh, Jesus didn't tell us to be busy. He told us to be compassionate, to care about people. And, and, and see, here's the, here's the thing. Compassion confronts our busyness. It, it just challenges the way that we're living our lives at that point of overscheduling. See, choosing compassion means that we allow God to direct our lives rather than serving our schedules, our tasks, and our agendas. See, if we don't do this, we'll always see people and pass by on the other side. It's just a given. If we see them at all, we'll just automatically pass by because we're running late, we don't have time, and somebody needs to help them, but it's not going to be us. Somebody needs to take time for them, but it's not going to be me. Because we don't give God an opportunity to interrupt our lives because we're too busy. See, if you don't make time, you're not going to have any time to care. There's only one good guy in the story, and he saw the man, and he had compassion on him. So to be a good Samaritan, then we have to see people with compassion, and we have to serve people. We have to serve people. The Samaritan served the man. He stopped. He bound up his wounds. He treated him as best he could medically. He put him on his animal. He took him to an inn. Took care of him. He actually helped somebody who was in need. He put the needs of the man before his own agenda. And I just want you to know, if you're going to love like Jesus, if you're going to love your neighbor, that means that you're going to have to live your life as a servant. You're going to have to live your life as a servant. And, and see, here's the thing. Our world loves Jesus light, right? They call the warm, fuzzy, kindness stuff, but without the conviction and truth. And a lot of times we're just as guilty. We like to come in and sing songs because they make us feel good, listen to the praise band, and, and hear a sermon that kind of pumps us up a little bit. But, but Jesus doesn't want to do Jesus light. He wants to call us to be servants for him. So what do we do? Because we like Jesus like, because we don't want to really live as a servant, but we want to feel good about ourselves, we pay it forward, right? We buy coffee for a stranger occasionally. We do random acts of kindness randomly. We volunteer. And, and, and we do a lot of that just so we'll feel good. So we can pat ourselves on the back, give ourselves a gold star. Yeah, I'm doing my part. Now, for the record, I'm in favor of all those things, especially if I'm in line behind you at Jack in the Box. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but here's the thing. I'm in favor of those as a lifestyle, not as an occasional occurrence. Because to love is not to sometimes serve. To love your neighbor means that you serve people when they need it, not when it fits our schedules or our mood. Let me say that again. To love like Jesus is to serve people when they need it, not when it fits our schedule or our mood. See, serving is an attitude to embrace, not an event to attend. And this is necessary to love your neighbor and to be a good Samaritan because serving confronts selfishness. I mean, loving requires serving, whether we signed up or not, whether we feel like it or not, whether we get recognition for, not, for it or not. But selfishness, just for the record, never wants to serve. Selfishness never wants to volunteer, never wants to give something up, never wants to be interrupted, never wants to change their schedule. Selfishness just wants what it wants. I'm just telling you because that's how I feel. Selfishly, I don't ever want to put someone else before my own needs. But Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. We talked about this last week. Luke 9, 23, if anyone's going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. That's the essence of being a disciple. So Jesus is saying, I want you to embrace this lifestyle. I want you to deny yourself and, and then serve people. By the way, that's why radical service is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service. Not random acts of kindness, but regular, planned acts of kindness by serving people where they are with the needs they have over and over and over and over again. By the way, that's why we teach Next Steps class called Serve. 
If you want to take next steps classes, August 28th, that's your next opportunity in Havasu. Parker, you guys have a different schedule. So, uh, but that's why we do so many of the community service projects because we want to help all of us learn to be servants. And so that together we can bless our neighbors in Lake Havasu City and Parker and lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the point. That's the purpose. So we celebrate serving and we rejoice in servants. Now, if you're sitting here going, yeah, that's true, and the Holy Spirit's nudging you, and you're like, yeah, Pastor Robert mentioned the announcements. I need to, I need to grab one of the serve cards and sign up. Let me just remind you, we got a first impressions team that makes everybody feel welcome when they come in. Did you guys feel welcomed when you came in today? Okay. Did you guys feel welcomed in Parker when you came in? See, they, they do a great job. So if you are friendly and like people, maybe you should volunteer to be on First Impressions. If you're a grump, please don't. <laughs> okay, we do not want grumpy people being at the door saying, hey, glad you're here. <laughs> Get out of the way and go take a seat, all right? You're, you're, God's not calling you to first impressions if that's your, your issue. I mean, we've got Calvary kids. And, and I'll just be real honest. You know, uh, have you noticed that since the pandemic hit that nobody wants to work anymore? And every place has help wanted signs. And they all have signs up to say, hey, give us, you know, be patient because we're short staffed. And uh, the same is kind of true of volunteers everywhere. So can I just tell you that, uh, you know, we, we could use your help in, in Calvary Kids if you love children and you can pass the background check. Okay, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, it's, it's, it's a great ministry. We want to take care of people's kids so they can come in here and experience this life-changing relationship with Jesus. We want people to teach our kids and love our kids and share the, the gospel with our kids. So if that's something that, that you're inclined to, don't think, well, I did my part. My kids are adults now. I mean, look, this is ministry, serving. It's making it happen. We've got needs in tech, so if you like electronic toys, you might want to volunteer and be on our tech team because none of this happens without our tech ministry, and they do a great job. Uh, or if you want to be Rambo, don't volunteer for the security team, okay? <laughs> but, if you, but if you're qualified and if you care about keeping people safe, and serving in that way, then that's a for real ministry. And it's not just security, it's security and safety. So they have medical people on standby and, and all kinds of people who are willing to help and check things out. So, so maybe you want to volunteer for that. And then we've got Calvary students. There's a few of you that are called to work with junior hires and you know it. Uh, we've got life group leaders. We've got so many places that you can serve. See, we want to help you be obedient to Jesus by being a servant. Because to be a good Samaritan, to love your neighbor, is to see people with compassion, to serve them, and to sacrifice for people. Sacrifice for people. I want you to see this. Verse 35. So easy to overlook it. The next day, the Samaritan took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He put his own money up to take care of this man. Now, see, it didn't only cost the Samaritan time and energy. It cost him money to love his neighbor. And he didn't know if the man could repay him. Probably not. He just got robbed. He was going to be out of work for a while. Didn't look good for him. But he even said, hey, I'll pay more if he, if he needs more attention, more, more money. So are we willing to sacrifice to love our neighbor? Are we willing to sacrifice to change the world, to change our community, to change our nation? Now, you guys know Calvary is a ministry of life change. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's why we do what we do. And, but I want you to understand, this ministry makes an impact on people because you guys are willing to sacrifice and that means to give, to provide resources so we can lead these communities to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And it reveals our love for God when we're willing to give and sacrifice for our neighbor. And by the way, it's healthy for us to sacrifice because sacrifice confronts greed. Sacrifice confronts our greed. Um, you see, when we sacrifice for others, when we practice generosity, when we use our resources to bless, 
it sets us free from financial selfishness. And you guys know what financial selfishness is, right? It's greed. Because greed is there. It's in our souls. We're, we're sinners, and greed takes root, and greed always wants more for me. I need more. I want more. I, you know, I got to take care of more. More is what, is what I'm called to. And look, all of us are tempted by greed. I don't care how selfless you are. There is, there is greed in your heart someplace. Hopefully you're killing it by practicing generosity. But, but when we sacrifice for others, it confronts that selfishness. It confronts that greed. See, we want life. We already said we wanted life. We already recognize that we're followers of Jesus, most of us. And, and if we want life, that means we need to sacrifice. Because again, last week we talked about this. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. He will save it. So if we choose to be a good Samaritan, to really love our neighbors, we're going to see people with compassion, we're going to serve, and we're going to sacrifice for them. And if we dare to love like Jesus, our world will change, and we might just change the world. Beginning in our community, and hopefully extending to our nation. So, I, I, look, if you love like Jesus, if you practice this whole Good Samaritan stuff, if you apply what Jesus says, I guarantee you that your world will change. God will start showing up. He'll be working through you. He will give you so much joy. You won't be able to stand it. You won't just have to sing the song about it. It'll come, become real in your life. And, and, and your world will change. Now, see, by the way, that's what happens whenever we follow Jesus because if we read and apply God's Word, God will change our lives. Uh, but see, here's the thing. We might change not just our world, but we might change the world around us. So uh, I just want to tell you, as a church, Calvary is trying to live out what we're teaching. Okay, so some things you may or may not know. Uh, Calvary gives away 20% of everything you give to us. That, I mean, that's our, our first line item in our budget is missions, and we give 20% to missions. So if you give a dollar in the offering box, 20 cents of that goes away. We give to, to everything from community projects all the way to the ends of the earth. And, and we've been doing that for a long, long time. In fact, uh, last fiscal year, uh, you probably don't know this either, our fiscal year runs from July through uh, June. So when you see the, the reports in the, in the bulletins and everything, uh, we just finished our fiscal year. So I was going to run totals. Hey, what was our total missions giving last year? Which is our budget plus what you guys give beyond that. Get this. You guys, we gave away to mission causes over $900,000 last year. Isn't that cool? I, I mean, I was stunned. That was more than I was expecting. I was like, that is so cool. Uh, so some of those things we gave to, uh, compassion. And again, this is not even included in that $900,000, but people of Calvary sponsor over 600 children of compassion, which means you're feeding them, you're educating them, you're, you're giving them health care and hope and introducing them to Jesus Christ. And as a church, we've built one compassion church center that's taking care of 300 kids, and we're in the process of building another one. That's because of generosity, because we want to love our neighbor. I mentioned this last week. We've, because of your generosity, we funded over 70 wells in Mozambique, which means 55,000 people a day are drinking clean, fresh water because of you. And through that ministry, uh, dozens of, of churches have been started. And, and in fact, the missionary uh, let me know just this week that they've gotten into three areas just, just this week where they'd never been before, never been allowed before because they're doing well projects in those places. Uh, we train Christian nurses in Thailand to be medical missionaries. We're providing care packages of essentials for foster care kids. That's our heart-to-heart -heart ministry. And, and I could just, I can go on and on. There's so much more. But, but see, here's the thing. We're choosing to be good Samaritans as a church. Are you choosing to love your neighbor? Are you choosing to love your neighbor? Because if you choose to love your neighbor, and if we all choose to love our neighbors, it will change our communities. And if Christians across this country do that, it'll change our nation. You can't control anyone else, but you can control what you do. 
I'm praying that you'll choose to love your neighbor like Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for loving us. I mean, we weren't even neighborly. We were living in rebellion and defiance in outright sin against you. And yet you loved us and sent your son into this world to be the sacrifice for our sins. And that's your demonstration of love for us. So Father, today we simply yield to you. We surrender to you. Knowing that you love us, knowing that you've saved us, knowing that you offer us the life-changing grace of Jesus Christ that if we call on his name, he'll forgive us of our sins and give us life eternal, even though we don't deserve it at all. But God, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we want to represent you to this world. We want to love our neighbors like never before. So open our eyes, open our hearts. Let us be people of compassion that see the hurting and care about them. God, teach us how to create margin so you can interrupt our lives and we can represent you. God, help us to adopt that whole attitude of serving others, of being willing to sacrifice so that you can not only change us, but this world around us. So God, let's not wait for others to lead. Give us the courage and the boldness to step into faith and to step into being your servants like never before so that our communities and this country can be what you created them to be. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.